Welcome to Hannah City Presbyterian Church. We're glad that you could join us today by video. We recognize that uh, this means that we're continuing to, to not worship together in person. The elders are excited to announce that we are looking at a targeted uh, in-person worship date as July 5th, our first Sunday back in the sanctuary again. It's not going to be what we're used to, so we want you to stay tuned. We're going to be working on details on how that will happen. And of course, as with any of these plans, uh, we are holding them loosely, and we ask that you be patient with us as we keep an eye on things and, and see how, how everything progresses, both in light of the pandemic, but also in light of uh, government expectations and orders. Uh, we want to honor the Lord. We want to be together. So we just ask for your prayers and your patience. But we're looking forward to that date as we do uh, uh, move toward it. We're also, uh, we're also grateful that we get an opportunity to continue to worship even in this venue. And uh, we want to encourage you that uh, if you uh, aren't with other people and you, and you feel comfortable in doing so, perhaps even pause this video and look for a few other folks that you can bring with you and, and worship together. Watch this video in a small group together uh, in a way that will uh, protect you uh, health-wise, but also encourage your faith because we are called to gather together as much as possible and, and to find opportunity to encourage each other. And all the more, the author of Hebrews says, until the coming of Jesus. So we're looking forward to uh, the day that we could do that all together. But in the meantime, take advantage of that opportunity. This morning as we enter into worship, we want to encourage you uh, to consider the meditation text from Job 31.23, For I was in terror of calamity from God, and I could, have, could not have faced His majesty. I want to encourage you to consider those words as the prelude is played. Thank you. 
Our call to worship today is from Psalm 74, 21. Let not the downtrodden turn back in shame. Let the poor and needy praise his name. Will you pray with me? Father, we are the poor and needy. We are poor in spirit. We see the poverty that is ours because of our sin. We see our great need for a Savior. And we see Jesus, who willingly took on that role, who brought the riches of heaven down, the grace and the mercy that could be ours through His shed blood and His perfect life on our behalf. And so we worship You, Lord God. We celebrate Your grace and Your kindness to us, the poor and the needy. We come to You with hands open. We don't bring anything before You by way of bartering. We only come as a, a people who are empty-handed and empty-pocketed empty and our hearts are are in need of your filling. So meet with us, we pray. Holy Spirit, I pray that every person engaging in this worship now would, would, through your power and your presence, hear the word that, can come fr that comes from heaven. Let it stir their affections. Let it stir their hearts. Let it move them toward the throne of grace. And we're praising you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, that you've given us the gift of worship together. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Uh, we want to encourage you to pick up your, your uh, worship guides, and there's going to be a couple of options there for, for the song that we're going to be starting with, Fairest Lord Jesus. There is, a, there is a VBS version that has hand motions. It's very similar to the traditional version. So if you've got any kids in the house, that might be a good one to uh, go with. And of course, if you're a kid at heart, you're welcome to click that link. Otherwise, the traditional version is also a clickable link there with words on the screen. So I encourage you. Take this opportunity. Worship our fairest Lord Jesus. Our scripture reading today is from Revelation chapter 4. This is a moment where John is given a vision of things that uh, on earth are almost impossible to describe. And yet, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it gives us this picture of of God on His throne. Consider these words in Revelation 4, verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. The first voice which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And seated on the thrones were 24 elders clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. And from the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are, and that are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to Him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. They cast their crowns before the throne saying, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. When we read a passage like that and you continue to read on in the incredible book of Revelation, you are seeing this unfolding 
declaration that there is a God who reigns in this universe. In fact, at the end of our service this morning, we're going to sing a song about that reigning God. But as we come before him and as we see his holiness, something we talked about in great detail last week, we see in the midst of that and in that moment, we see also our sin and we see the promise that that the one who will be declared the crowned king is also the one who can stand in judgment over us. He is the one on the throne. And so he invites us to come into his presence, acknowledging not only his glory and his holiness, but our sin. And so we do that every week. We take a moment where we pause and we ask, God in heaven, how have I dishonored you? How have I acted as if I was the one on that throne? How have I acted as if I were the one who who deserved honor and praise in this world and perhaps even in the next in ways that we don't even always realize? God invites us to come to him with our hearts overwhelmed by his holiness and the foolishness of that, that, that chasing that we do to seek glory for ourselves. So let's take a moment seeking way to ask God for the to, to own for us to own the ways that we have failed to honor him, failed to bring glory to him, failed to resist the urge to seek glory for ourselves. Let's pray to our merciful God for his forgiveness. Father, in, indeed, we are sinners before you. We come with all of our foolishness in mind as we, as we stand before a holy God, the one who is rightly on the throne. Forgive us for trying to take that throne. Forgive us to, for trying to build our towers to the heavens to make a name for ourselves. Father, we long for, we look forward to with joy and trepidation the day when we will see you on your throne, rightly judging the nations, see you on the throne, rightly even declaring and letting us see the full measure of our own sin, and yet not shrieking back in, sh- in shame, but coming near you and falling at your feet with joyful humility that you have forgiven us. You've forgiven every wayward thought. You've forgiven every wayward action, every wayward word. Father, thank you for the mercy of Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for forgiving us. Thank you for the opportunity that we have to be reminded that your holiness need not keep us from you because your holiness was also met by your loving kindness in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for my sins. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for drawing us close to yourself. Thank you for declaring that you're not ashamed, even though sometimes we are. You're not ashamed to call us brothers. We praise you and we thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing about that incredible mercy of Jesus and the grace that is ours. The grace that we will sing is greater than all our sins. So use the worship guide, click that link, and we'll wait for you. We've been reminded of God's greatness and His glory. We've been reminded as we stand before that of our need for a Savior. I want to encourage us now to be remembering and be reminded of the incredible grace of a God who loves to hear from His people. There have been lots of things that have gone on in your week. I know there are things that you've not shared even publicly. We want to take a moment and pause and give you an opportunity to give praise to God for the ways He's answered prayers. To, give, to take a moment to give uh, pause and remember the God who alone can give you this day your li- daily bread, who can heal uh, your, your pains, and, and who will hold you when those, the healing doesn't come in the way that we think it ought. So let's pause for a moment, asking God in His grace to meet us with our needs. 
we are especially mindful of a few needs in particular. We're, we're mindful of the, the recent surgery of Nick Drake, a, a, a follow-up to his previous surgery. We're grateful that he's out of surgery and he's healing up today. We want to ask that you continue to be in prayer. We want to ask that you continue to be in prayer for my sister, Danielle, um, and the loss of her husband, Greg. Um, thank you for those of you who've been already praying about that. And we want to ask that you continue to pray for Shirley Wilson's son-in-law, Russ, and for her daughter, Leslie, as she, as she walks through this journey and, and experiences the burden of bearing uh, the, the, the discomfort and the sadness of watching her husband suffer right now. Pray for his healing and, and, and even pray for, in all of these situations, that hearts that aren't turned toward Jesus would turn toward Jesus. That if there are among those who are in the midst of discomfort and pain, that they would see that there is only one source for their ultimate healing, a healing of their relationship with God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So I want to ask you to be in prayer with me. Let's pray together. Father, we do pray today for your mercy and your grace. You call us to, to pray that your kingdom co would come on earth as it is in heaven, that we would take seriously the responsibility of being a part of that answered prayer, that we would see to it that, that we proclaim the reigning king, that his kingdom would advance in the hearts of those who don't know you. Lord, we recognize that sometimes you do that by letting us see the frailty of our lives, letting us see how messed up this world is. We think of uh, our nation, we think of the turmoil, we think of the disagreements and the, and, the, and the tensions that rise at the highest levels of our government, even down to the local uh, conversations that we have across the, the fence with our neighbors. Father, there are so much discomfort, so much disagreement, so much inability to hear and to see what is true. Lord, would you bring your Spirit to bear in these moments. Holy Spirit, open hearts, open eyes. Use our dis discomfort to see that there is a King that is not us. And Father, we pray especially for healing and for grace for the people that we love who are hurting right now. We are grateful for a successful surgery for Nick. We pray that the healing would be more swift than they anticipated. We pray for Russ and, and, and his collapsed lung, Lord. We pray that you would uh, strengthen his body. And, and if by the time of uh, this watching he is on the other side of that, we give you praise for that. And we ask that you continue to sustain him. Lord, we ask for sustaining and encouragement for my sister as she mourns the loss of her husband. Father, I ask that you would give continued words and that the words that I share to the family would be words of life and words of hope. Father, turn all wayward hearts to yourself. Let those who would be saved cry out to you as the only one who can. Father, I pray for marriages right now in our congregation. I think of all the tensions and the frustrations and even the disagreements that can happen within each of our homes on how things ought to go, on how we ought to deal with COVID, on how we ought to deal with the racist, racism issues that are going on in our country and who we ought to vote for in the next election. So many disagreements and so many tensions within our families. Lord, deal with our prideful hearts. Give us ears to listen to be quick to listen and slow to speak and slow to become angry. Bring, bring unity to the body. Bring clarity to each one of us and help us to walk out what it means to truly be followers of Jesus. And we pray that even in the mom this moment now, as we get ready to hear from your word, would you give us ears to hear? We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's passage is from Psalm 10 as we continue our study in, in this, the disciples' songbook, the, 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 the book of Psalms, this incredible hymnal that was written over a thousand years or so that speaks to the incredible glory of God and invites God's people to bring their hearts, their anger, their hurt, their joy, to bring it all and lay it at the feet of the King of the universe. And so as disciples who follow after our Savior Jesus, who himself would have sung these 
hymns, as we said last week, as he, he would have sung these psalms and read these psalms and, and understood and grown through these psalms in his humanity, we come to the psalms and we learn as well. We grow at the feet of our great and wise king. And so we come to a psalm like Psalm 10, and in a lot of ways, it'll, it'll carry some of the same themes of the psalm we looked at last week, Psalm 5. It's going to talk a lot about justice today. And, and, and in particular, last week we talked about how that just God justifies us so that when we enter into calls for justice, we do so from a right, humble perspective. This week we're going to continue that idea of the vindicating work of Jesus. We recognize that God in His vindication, in His justice, um, will at times make us feel exceedingly uncomfortable. He's going to call us to see Him in His holiness and to, at the same time, know that we can run to Him with our ache. And that's what this psalmist is going to offer to us today in Psalm 10. I want to encourage you with these words and invite you to listen and maybe even read along. And if you are able and would like to, for, in honor of the Word, to stand in psalm, for this reading of this psalm, we want to encourage you to do so. But hear God's Word in Psalm 10, beginning in verse 1. Why, O Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes that they have devised. For the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. In the pride of his face, the wicked does not seek him. All his thoughts are, there is no God. His ways prosper at all times. Your judgments are on high, out of his sight. As for all of his foes, he puffs at them. He says in his heart, I shall not be moved. Throughout all generations, I shall not meet adversity. His mouth is filled with cursing and deceit and oppression, and under his tongue are mischief and iniquity. He sits in ambush in the, in the villages, in hiding places. He murders the innocent. His eyes stealthily watch for the helpless. He lurks in ambush like a lion in his thicket. He lurks that he may seize the Poor. He seizes the poor when he draws him into his net. The helpless are crushed, sink down, and fall by his might. He says in his heart, God has forgotten. He's hidden his face. He will never see it. Arise, O Lord. O God, lift up your hand. Forget not the, the afflicted. Why does the wicked renounce God and say in his heart, you will not call to account? But you do see. For you note mischief and vexation, that you may take it in your hands. To you the helpless commits himself. You have been the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and evildoer. Call his wickedness to account till you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations perish from his land. O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted. You will strengthen their heart. You will incline your ear to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed so that man who is of earth, may strike terror no more. Let's pray. Father, help us to hear from this word and encourage and strengthen our sense of confidence in your strength and your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Perhaps you've seen the movie Beauty and the Beast, the old cartoon from the 90s. Or maybe you saw the more recent live-action remake of it. There's a, an incredible moment at the end of that story, and if you don't know the story, here's the quick recap. There is a young man who in his pride is cursed to live like a beast until his 21st birthday, at which point, if he hasn't found love, he 
will stay a beast forever and all of his servants who've now turned into plates and cupboards and couches and everything in his in his home in his castle will also stay those things forever and and of course they all of these magical uh plates and saucers and spoons and sofas and everything want him to find love and they seek out a way to find him love and in a weird kind of twist uh, a young woman is kidnapped Belle beauty uh is kidnapped and finds herself in the uh in the dungeon of this man or in the in the home of this man unable to to leave and over time she does fall in love with the beast this prince who's been cursed and you get to the end of the movie though and another man a man by the name of Gaston comes along and seeks to kill the beast to show his greatness to the townspeople and and uh, he gathers the townspeople and they rush to the to the castle and they 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 try to destroy the beast along the way and but then a battle between Gaston and the beast takes place and the beast is at this point is ready to uh, takes over the, the in the battle and is ready to destroy Gaston to remove the threat forever but then you have that moment that happens in so many Hollywood movies and so many stories he's gripped with a, a willingness to show mercy instead of justice and so he withholds ultimate justice and he and he doesn't kill Gaston he just throws him aside and he goes to embrace Belle as the beast yet and unbeknownst to him in his anger and his pride Gaston even though he's been shown mercy picks up a knife and plunges it into the back of the beast and the beast howls in in pain and his arm whip goes backward and he knocks Gaston off balance and Gaston tumbles to his death. So while we watch as viewers, we have this moment where we appreciate the mercy that's initially granted, but then deep down we say, oh good, justice is done, Gaston is removed. Interestingly enough, if you think about a lot of movies that's the storyline there's that moment where justice could be served where vindication could come at, in in the sense of the the individual hero ready to avenge and do the justice himself or herself only to with, withhold that justice and show mercy instead but interestingly in a lot of those very same shows and a lot of those very same movies justice ends up getting done anyway perhaps the person who was being shown ju uh, mercy will then in in that moment jump up with a gun or with a knife like Gaston did or whatever and then all of a sudden uh, the, the 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 police will show up and they'll shoot that person and they'll die or or the the good guy will shoot them in self-defense and so it will no longer feel like justice it was just self-defense and we'll still get the justice but we won't feel the ickiness of it but then there's a whole course of other movies along the way movies that gladly enter into the justice motif and vengeance and 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 all kinds of movies in that in that way D death wish the old one death wish the more recent remake you've got kill bill kill bill 2 kill bill 3 you've got taken and taken one or two and taken three you've got the less uh, the, the more clearly named and aptly named and maybe too on the nose named movie called Revenge. And you've got all kinds of vengeance movies because there's something in the human heart that longs for vengeance. There's something in the human heart that longs for evil to be vanquished and for good to win. And sometimes in our hearts, we want to be the ones who deliver it. And we know God in his word says, vengeance is mine. Do not repay evil. But we still feel that desire, and so we live vicariously through others. Whether we're watching those movies, or we're watching that TV show, or we're secretly smiling when the bad guy gets it in the end, we long for justice. And we don't just do that in that form. And maybe we don't pick up a gun and we go for vigilante justice. Maybe we don't enter into the looting and the rioting or whatever that we see in our, in our messed up world right now. Maybe we... Maybe we think we're above it all, and yet we find ourselves, when somebody harshly speaks to us, we harshly speak back. We're just pursuing justice. 
We may not even realize that's what we're doing, but we're not leaving that vengeance to God. We feel this tension and this desire to have evil dealt with. Sometimes we deal with it in sinful ways, but we long for it to be dealt with. And the psalmist does too. In this case, back in chapter 9, he's looking at evil in, 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 in chapter or Psalm 9 and Psalm 10. He's looking at evil in its, in its reality and a call for God to show justice. While sometimes in the Psalms that evil is out there somewhere, what we find from Psalm 10 is that this is evil within the people of God toward other people who are claiming the very same name of Yahweh as their God. We're seeing evil in the camp, not evil out there. What we're going to do this morning, what we're going to notice this, today in this passage, is that, that God's justice is something that he wants us to call out for. As we said last week, he invites us to pray that justice would be done. He invites us to bring our ache. He invites us, invites us to bring that, those moments like we see at the very first verse. Why, O oh Lord, do you stand far away? Why do you hide yourself in times of trouble? The psalmist feels frustrated that God seems so distant. He feels frustrated that God doesn't seem to be listening or caring about the moment in front of him. And in the course of that frustration, he, he slowly moves toward a release of that frustration. He moves from dealing with and talking about that wickedness in, in terms of exploring the heart of the wicked person. And then you're going to see in this passage that he's going to talk about the heart of those who are helpless and are victims of the, of the wicked. And finally, we're going to get to see him explore the incredible heart of the king who will, who will deal with wickedness. So let's look at that together. Let's look at how our God moves us through faith, as he does with the psalmist. He moves us from that hungering or that recognition that something is messed up, something is broken, we're asking the question, are you going to act? And then we move from there to say, to, to, to actually say, act, God. And then from the, are you going to act and the act, we come to the I trust. It's the movement of faith. I'm in need. You can meet that need. God, meet that need. I trust that you will. That's faith. Ultimately, the ultimate faith is in Jesus. And so he invites us to look at this and to declare God's justice in the midst of it by, first of all, let's look again at the heart of the wicked. Verses 2 through 11 share the heart of the wicked. I want to notice, I want us to notice just three little ways that the heart of the wicked is explored here. First of all, in their selfish gain at the, at the expense of others. Uh, we, we see that at work. Verses 2 and 3. In arrogance, the wicked hotly pursue the poor. Let them be caught in the schemes they have devised, for the wicked boasts of the desires of his soul, and the one greedy for gain curses and renounces the Lord. There is this heart that wants what it wants, and it will selfishly pursue gain at the expense of others. We've seen that in our world. You've probably tasted that from someone else, where you felt used, where you felt diminished, where you felt attacked so that someone else could have what you had, so they could have a sense of a piece of the pie at your expense. Selfish gain. We see it all over in our world. We see the, the terrifying reality of that in so many ways, so many different areas of injustice in our world. We see it in, the, in, in, the, in crimes against people in, in, in our own community. When someone steals from another person, it's an injustice. We see it when someone experiences a, a lack of justice in, in, in places where justice should be served maybe because of the color of the skin, maybe because of the amount of money they have in their bank account, maybe because they are an inconvenience and, they be, and then their, their life is snuffed out through 
the, the awfulness of abortion. We see it in racism. We see it in classism. We see it in abortion. We see it in payday loans and, and, and title loans that, that prey on the, the anxieties of the poor. We see it all over the place. It's, it's it. If we were to talk about the lament psalms the, in, 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 a, in a certain way, it would be helpful for us to think about the praise psalms that we see. The praise psalms are sort of like the Louis Armstrong version of what a wonderful world. They're acknowledging God's beauty and His glory and His creation and, and His saving works. The lament psalms are the ones that are, that are calling out the other phrases like, I can't breathe when a neck is on when a, when a knee is on the neck of someone and their life is taken from them for others it's in the i can't sleep because i'm afraid that when i wake up after after the looting and rioting i won't have a livelihood anymore and of course as i said before it's in even the if they if they could if they could articulate their voice in the life of the unborn who say i'll never get a chance to breathe because of the injustice of abortion We feel it all the time, selfish gain at the expense of others. But we also, uh, well, in fact, let me me read a quote from uh, Tim Keller. He writes, Augustine taught that there were two cities or ways to live in society, one based on self-giving and one on self-serving. To worship the desires of the heart leads to habits of self-expression and self-assertion rather than a sacrificial love. It is this way of life that appears to be ascendant in the world with a God who seems to be far away and doing nothing about it. This psalm describes this situation in painful detail, Keller says, as a way of keeping us from even subtly going along with this manner of living. Like the psalmist, we need to resist it in prayer and in our daily lives. The psalmist feels that reality, a selfish gain at the expense of others, but also the, the heart of the wicked is, is godless conviction before the face of God. It's, this, it's the person who says in verse 4, uh, in, in their pride, of the, they will say, there is no God. And then you go up to verse 11 and he says, in his heart, he says, God's forgotten and his, hidden his face he will never see. They're, they're, the, the heart of the wicked moves in the realm of assuming or disallowing or, or considering the possibility that there is no God. It's funny, when we were kids, and, and you, if you've ever had children or babysat children, you've seen this on full display. You, you walk into a room as a child is starting to reach for a cookie that they're not supposed to have, and you say, no, you can't have that cookie, and they pull their hand away, and they... They show the right, right amount of remorse on their face and, and so you think, okay, mission accomplished, message delivered. And you start to walk away and you go around the corner and you get that feeling, you know that feeling. You turn back around and there they are. They're going right back up for the cookie again. What are they doing? In that moment, they're forgetting that the authority that's over them. They've chosen to ignore it because if it's not in the room, it's not real. And that's what it feels like. The psalmist feels like that's what the wicked experience. If they don't hear God's and see God's justice immediately, they slowly become comfortable with a, the notion that there is no God, and then they will begin to take advantage. And, and that's the, the anxiousness of our hearts, and that is a declaration and a picture of, of the heart of the wicked. And then, of course, the last piece of that is arrogant boasts in seasons of plenty. It's not just that they get to the place where they don't experience the judgment of God and so they get complacent and begin to to abuse and take advantage. They also look at all they have and think, well, I must be doing something right. It must be okay that I make these choices, that I live at the expense of others, that I that I even experience a godless conviction. I am winning. And if I'm winning and life is good and for me, then it must be that I'm good. And I don't need to worry about anything. And so you have that played out in verses 5 and 6. His way prospers all the time. In his heart, he says, I shall not be moved. Even when... Uh, adversaries come along. He says, you can't beat me. I, I, I'm winning. 
And so you have that sense happening, this building kind of reality going on. But what's interesting is what we tend to do as Christians is we tend to notice that wickedness, the heart of wickedness, out there somewhere. But we forget to notice it right inside of us. You, you see, for example, that selfish gain at the expense of others played out in, in Philippians chapter 1. In Philippians chapter 1, the apostle Paul is talking about about the uh, people who in their foolishness and pride are, are trying to undercut Paul's message, but they're also preaching Christ, but they're doing it for selfish motives. As it says in verse 17, they proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition. And Paul says, oh, that's terrible. Nonetheless, he's grateful, God, that Christ's name is being, uh, being uh, acknowledged anyway, so he'll take it. He'll take the lumps even if it, if it means that Jesus is being proclaimed. But you'll notice in that chapter, he's not saying that their selfish ambition is good. And he wants the Philippians to understand that's not good, even though the outcome proves to be good. It's not good that they're preaching out of selfish ambition. And he wants the Philippians to join him and going, yeah, that's bad. But then you come to chapter 2. The apostle continues to encourage the, the, them, and, and he says, there, if there's any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being full of accord and of one mind. And then he says these words, you, Philippians, do nothing out of selfish ambition. At which point they ought to pause and say, wait, but I thought you were talking about the false teachers that were, or, or even the, the people that were trying to undercut your message. That's not us, but Paul is wanting us to understand that that heart of wickedness sometimes can slip right into us. That we can find all kinds of interesting ways that we will, that we will quietly, subversively, unintentionally, maybe subconsciously, find ourselves seeking our own interests over others, of, in, in effect, living that godless conviction. As Paul Tripp says, sometimes we act like practical atheists. This is what, what uh, Dennis Johnson meant in his commentary on Philippians, Philippians when he references Philippians 1.17 and Philippians 2.3. He says, to diagnose the cause of their own in, interpersonal friction or indifference, because there were some friction and some battles going on within the body of Christ there. He challenges each of them and us to face the question, why do I do what I'm doing in service to God and in church and in home and in my workplace? Am I driven by self-centered motives, even when I supposedly am helping others? Am I self-serving even while serving others, wanting and hoping to be noticed so that I receive the appreciation and recognition that I think I deserve? Whether I express it outwardly or not, do I nurse resentment when my hard work is ignored or when my brilliant ideas are not followed? Do you feel that? Does that cause tension in your heart? Do you feel that sense of, oh, sometimes I am seeking my own good. I am seeking my own praise rather than really truly seeking to serve and to love and to give myself away, to consider others, as Paul will go on to say in that chapter, as more important than myself. We, we do this in all kinds of ways. We do it in parenting, where very subtly, when our kids are giving us a headache and they're driving us a little crazy, we will begin to withhold our affection. We'll withhold praise. We'll withhold, if we want to be honest, a little bit of our love until they fall back in line. We do it when they're children. We do it when they're adults. We hold back. We do this to each other. We threaten. We withhold, withhold warmth. We withhold allowance. We withhold time. We withhold kind words. We do it with all those things, but we do it in the church as well. Not just in our parenting or in our relationships in general, but we do it in the church. Well, I don't like the way the church is doing that thing, so I'm going to withhold my tithe. I'm not going to get involved in, uh, in the life of the church. I'm going to stay at arm's length because, because they're not doing a ministry that I wanted them to do. We do it so many different ways. We have that little bit of the heart of the wicked at play in us. And, and the psalmist would invite us to own the little bitty reflections of that terrible picture that he presents in chapter uh, 10, verses 2 through 11, and ask, are we seeing a little bit of that in us? So the heart of the wicked there.
Not only do we see the heart then of the wicked at play in this passage and sometimes have to own it for ourselves, we also see, though, that God does have a message to the heart of the helpless. He does come toward the helpless and speak to them in their helplessness. He has a special place in his heart for their hearts, and he wants to hold it tenderly. That language of the helpless, we see it work in multiple places, as he says in verse 14, but you do see that, the wicked, and you do see what they're doing to the heart of the helpless. You Take that mischief and vexation in your hands, he says in verse 14. To you the helpless commits himself. You've been the helper of the fatherless. There, so you see a couple of things there. And then in verse 18 it says that God would seek to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed. The helpless are sometimes referred to as the oppressed and, to, uh, and as the fatherless. So let's look at those two images, the, the fatherless first. In there, that's referenced in 14 and verse 18. Lamentations 5.3 says we have become orphans and fatherless. So throughout the Old Testament scriptures, there's references to the fatherlessness of people, of the marginalized, of the hurting, of the aching. And, and we feel that, don't we? We feel that reality of a sense of aloneness, of, of need. Scott Filcher in his book, The Orphan Generation, talks about how young people are especially feeling that reality. In fact, he he shares uh, this story. He says, what do the following have in common? Lilo and Lilo and Stitch, Aladdin, Belle and Beauty and the Beast, Tarzan, Buzz Lightyear, Peter Pan, The Children and Escape from To Which Mountain, Ariel and the Little Mermaid, James and James and the Giant Peach. I'm going to give you all a whole bunch of these because maybe you've watched one or two of these shows. Maybe you've watched several of them. Nemo and Finding Nemo. Simba and the Lion King. Uh, The Three Girls in Despicable Me. Uh, Harry Potter, Batman, Superman, Spider-Man, Iron Man. In all of these different stories, what do they all have in common? What is it about these stories that's so fascinating to us? It's that they're all either orphaned or partially orphaned because they've lost a father, they've lost a mother, they maybe have lost both. We feel there the the draw of wanting to see the, the person who was orphaned, who felt alone, take matters into their hands and do something about it or experience rescue. We want to see the fatherless be okay. We feel that pull and we feel that draw. And that's the message of the Bible. That God is the father of the fatherless. That he takes the fatherless and places them in families. That he in his grace would call orphaned people into a relationship with himself that he would be their father. That's the picture of the Bible, but there's, a, there's the heart that longs for that. And so we're grateful that he speaks into that. We're grateful that he challenges our orphaned status, that he acknowledges that those who would have been orphans can be sons and daughters, but we feel that need. We feel that loneliness. We feel that sense of abandonment that only God can meet, and in especially in an unjust world. as whole segments of society feel like they don't matter, that they feel voiceless, that they feel, in effect, fatherless. But also, not only is the heart of the helpless that the fatherless would find a father, the heart of the helpless is that they are oppressed and that they would find a champion. And that's what we see there as well, that he will do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed. He will take note of the mischief and the vexation. He's going to fight the battle that we are not strong enough to fight on our own. I remember when I was in Israel back in 2010 or so, and, uh, and, I, and, and, and I was sitting with, across the table at a breakfast with one of my professors. He was, he was a professor from seminary named Jerem Bars, and, and, and he was our sp- spiritual guide for the trip. And there was a moment in which he 
was just asking me questions about my life. Tell me about your childhood. Tell me about your parents. Tell me about your siblings. And, and he's, he's asking these questions. And I, I'm so used to telling the story. I, didn't even, I hadn't even fully felt it at that moment as I'm sitting there. And I'm, saying, I'm sharing about how my dad left when I was about four. And how there were a series of men in our lives that just kind of came and went. And then I was feeling about, or, or then I was ex- expressing appreciation for my, my stepdad, uh, Willie, that uh, came into my life later in my teenage years, but then was taken from us by cancer. And as I shared some of that story, I, I was eating and talking and wasn't really paying attention. And I look up and Jerem is weeping. He's just crying. And, and I was kind of thrown by it. I'm like, why, why are you crying? And he looked at me and he said, I'm so sorry. I love you. That's all he said. This British guy. That you think, when you think of British folks stereotypically, you think of just buttoned up and emotions kept in check and he's weeping. Because in that moment, he was remembering the fatherliness of God and pouring it out on me. To that very awkward moment as we're parting at the end of the eight days that we had together in Israel, he hugged me and he kissed me on the cheek. More fatherly care as he bound up the heart of this orphan-like adult that still felt the wounds, and I felt full. He was picturing and and modeling that fatherly love. And I love that that's the heart of our God, that He would be a God who would want to meet the heart of the helpless, that He would commit Himself to them, that He would, in verse 17, strengthen their heart. So our God, through this psalm, would invite us to reflect honestly on the heart of the wicked. He would invite us to reflect with joy and comfort on our God who is the one who comes toward the fatherless and the oppressed to give them both a father and a champion. He is going to then finally reveal in this call for justice, He's going to reveal His heart, the heart of our knowing King, verses 12 through 17. Remember, verses 1 through 11 are emphasizing all that's messed up in this world. 12 through 17 or 18 is actually picturing the full measure of, of God's response as the psalmist cries out, God, arise. And so God's going to arise. And in it, he's going to declare a few things about his heart. This God who sees the heart of the wicked and he sees the heart of the helpless is going to be the God who says, I see it. And I hear it, and I have a response to it. And I love that about this passage. This incredible psalm reminds us, first of all, that he is the one who sees. The psalmist himself says, But you do see, for you note mischief and vexation. Verse 17, he says, O Lord, you hear the desire of the afflicted, of the afflicted. This is the God that's being declared is the God who knows, sees, and hears it all. What a comfort when you feel like it's silent. When you're like the psalmist at the beginning of this song and saying, "Do you stand? Why do you stand far away? Why are you hiding yourself in times of trouble?" By this point in the psalm, he's saying, "He's not hiding. He is seeing. He is hearing the injustice." that you are experiencing, and He will respond. It reminds me of what you find in Genesis chapter 16. As we studied that incredible book uh, last year or two, um, we we looked at the, the story of Hagar, the Egyptian maidservant for Abraham and Sarah, who in her, uh, who's, who's being used really to provide an heir for Abraham. And after she has that child, Ishmael, she, uh, she finds herself feeling uh, uh, pretty happy that she has, uh, having obtained a child through that. But Sarah becomes jealous. She becomes angry and she starts to abuse 
Hagar. And so what does Hagar do? She she flees into the wilderness. And it says in verse 7, the angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness and the spring on the way to Shur. And he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, why are you why have you come from and where have you come from and where are you going? She said, I'm fleeing from my mistress Sarai. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Return to your mistress and submit to her. The angel of the Lord also said to her, I will surely multiply your offspring so that they cannot be numbered for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are pregnant. And you shall bear a son. You shall call his name Ishmael. Because the Lord has listened to your affliction, he shall be a wild donkey of a man, his hand against everyone and everyone's hand against him, and he shall dwell over against all his kinsmen. And now now listen to these words. So he says, I have heard your cries, and I want you to name your child Ishmael, which means the Lord has heard. So she called the name of the place you are God, the God of seeing. For she said, Truly, here I have seen him who looks after me. Therefore the well was called Ber Lahai Roy, and it lies between Kedesh and Bered. So you have Hagar who, in the injustice that she's experiencing, as she's going to be, she's conceived and she's going to give birth to a child, is overwhelmed and feels completely ignored and lost and alone. She feels fatherless. She feels oppressed. And God says, I see you and I hear you. I don't know what your experience is right now. I don't know how, what particular thing the Lord is seeing and hearing as you cry out to him. But rest assured, the Bible is clear. He is the seeing one and he is the hearing one. I love how Spurgeon puts it as he talks about this passage he says grief has an eloquent voice when mercy is the listener i think i see her there that's hagar her eyes red with weeping her spirit broken down with the hunger of her journey sitting a while and refreshed a moment and resolved not to stoop and never to go back and then again shuddering at the darkness that lay before her and afraid to go on in such a state as that god met with her to all intents and purposes she was a friendless outcast woman. She had left the only tents where she could claim shelter. She had gone into the wilderness, no father, no mother, no brother, no sister to care for her. She turned her back on those who had any interest in her, and now she was afraid, uh, left alone, alone in the desert land, without an eye to pity or a hand to help. Under those peculiar cir- circumstances of trial and sin, commingled, God met with her, and there came home to her what she had often heard before but never felt. There is a God. God is not an impalpable somebody up there who has nothing to do with me, but there is God here, here, and he sees me. God deals with me, Spurgeon writes, not far away, asleep or blind, but God sees me. Oh, it is a glorious thing when the conviction arises in the soul. I am not alone. I am not friendless after all. There is a God and a God who sees me and takes such notice that he speaks to me. I love that. We have a God who who has a heart for us such that he would see us and he would hear us. And paradoxically, that God would find a way to rescue us. And he would do it by becoming the oppressed one. He would come do it by becoming the fatherless one. Remember, when he's on that cross, everyone abandons him. He's cursed and he's spit upon and he's mocked for our salvation. And that Savior Jesus Christ on that cross would cry out, not only has the world abandoned me, my friends have left me, but he cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Our Savior in that moment experience the ultimate fatherlessness. The ultimate oppression of the wrath of God being poured out on him for our sins. And he gives us final freedom. And so that Savior who hears and sees and rescues us by becoming the one who needed 
who, who, who was oppressed and who was forsaken is the one who will someday come again and make right what is wrong. You see that play out in, in the book of Revelation. In 1920 and 21, the culmination and the conclusion of the whole story. 19, the rider on the white horse comes and he defeats the nations who have turned their backs on God and have hurt his people. Verse or chapter 20 points to how Satan himself is going to finally be defeated, verses 7 and following. And then verse or chapter 21, verses 1 and following, is going to declare how that Savior, that conquering king who's going to bring justice to bear finally and completely is going to provide a place where there is no more tears there are no more there is no more uh, death there is no more dying there is no more uh, judgments because the final judgment has been given as he sits on his great white throne that god and that king is the one we look forward to i love how owen straken puts it. He says, sin will not cease because of a vague trajectory in the cosmos toward goodness. The end of sin will come because Jesus will split the sky and make the whole earth his threshing floor. This truth should inspire surging hope in the church. It should also drive us to evangelize all that we can, remembering that the blunt force of the Christian doctrine of judgment has often awakened the slumbering. We do not want any sinner to taste the wrath of God. So like the revivalist sermonizing of Jonathan Edwards many years ago, we pray, we preach Christ, and we implore fellow image bearers to flee Sodom. He writes, Christianity is this forward-looking faith. The celestial city, as John Bunyan reminded us, is not far off. There is a momentum, a driving urgency in the kingdom. We can't forget what God is doing, where history is going, and how short the time is. You could say this, say it this way. We should be so eternity minded that we are of some earthly good. See, the promise of divine justice, Strachan says, is glorious. But in the biblical story, it yields still a greater promise. In the New Jerusalem, we will worship the Lamb who has atoned for sin, destroyed evil, and fulfilled the ancient prophecy by crushing the serpent's head. And even though a skeptical culture would ask, uh, would ask the question, he writes, can you trust a God who punishes sin? He says, we know, not only do we answer yes, we respond that we cannot trust a God who does not punish sin to the uttermost. How comforting, how kind, of God to save us, he says, how he will protect us and how he will bring us all home. Let's pray. Father, thank you for reminding us that you will bring us home, that you will deal definitively with injustice in our world, with sin even in our own hearts, that you are preparing a kingdom forever that will be without sin. There will be no gates on the on the walls because because there will be no more enemies that we need protected from because you'll be destroying them all. And we look forward to that day and we celebrate you and we ask on behalf of all those who are crying out for justice today, Lord, would you bring it? But first, would you remind of Jesus who is our only escape from that judgment? We pray in his name. Amen. We encourage you to Use the worship guide and sing that final song that reminds us of our great King as we sing, Thy God reigneth. Our benediction is from that same passage at the end of Revelation, Revelation 21. Consider this incredible good word, it is done. Jesus says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payments. The one who conquers will have the heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, idolaters, all liars, their portion will be in the lake of fire, the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. And we praise God that we've escaped such a death. Amen.